Hey everyone, what's up? We're for Gorilla Poker. Today I'm gonna try a slightly different format. I want to start out by sharing with you guys for various real life reasons. I have been playing less poker over the past few months. Real life stuff has been a bit tilting. So as I'm going back, I found myself on a bit of a tilt cycle. What happens is that as I'm playing, my level of frustration and anger rises really fast. And what this means is that my ability to think spots through and make good decisions deteriorates really fast. So I might start a session playing well, you know, lose a pot in a tilting fashion. And, and for me at this stage, anyway, I lose a pot is a bit tilting. And the tilt mounts quickly. And, and then at some point, I'm, I'm like, just, you know, they can't have it again kind of thought process rather than, than thinking spots through, which is terrible. As someone who's coached many players, I have seen this happen to a bunch of people over the years. It often is triggered by some personal issue or some long stretch of bad luck, but maybe your girlfriend broke up with you or your stock portfolio dropped a lot or whatever, and it makes you more susceptible to this kind of thing. And then as it goes on and on, you start losing confidence and the tilt mounts and it's, I, I call it the circle of death. So I'm going to try kind of climbing out of it and want to make you guys part of that process. So what I'm going to do is rather than do a live play session, I already recorded a live play session. I'm going to review a few of the big hands during the session, share my thought process and kind of keep myself on track, train my brain again to think about the correct things, have accountability when I'm making plays and, and make kind of shorter sessions, more study time. I think all these things are, are conducive to to slowly getting back on track and very, very important thing to do. This happens to, I think, almost everyone as they're playing poker. So yeah, starting the session off at 1KNL, tagging some players, haven't played 1KNL here for a while. Red tag is someone who I suspect might be a weaker player, I'm not sure yet. Okay, so first hand of the session is me with 9-8 offsuit in the big blind against a guy called Lucky Idiot. Obviously gonna call from the big blind, it's not high up in my range, but we'll proceed from there. And I get kind of a good board for my hand. King, six, deuce, two tone. Might look like you miss, but I see like two overs to middle pair. Backdoor straight draws, backdoor flush draws. Just seems like a board where eight, nine is definitely continuing flop in some capacity versus a bet. My opponent decides to check. And already we have kind of a first interesting decision where what do you do with 8-9? Do you stab or check back? This is a, a 500 NL table versus an unknown reg. I, I tend to assume checking ranges are under defended, which means stabbing overperforms and checking back overperforms, like everything overperforms because his, his range is just weak. So uh, you want to be putting on some amount of extra pressure compared to GTO. Here, I think I decided to bet one third pot which you know i could do with a very wide range he thinks in fold so good start to the session second hand just kind of walk you guys through this but this is one of the things that happens as i get a bit tilted bottom right table you know it's, it's been a long break it's a really small raise i want to call king 10 offsuit there's maybe recreational in the big blind but the play here is just a fold the hand's not good enough so third hand of the session I have nine deuce off and it's a limp pot BBB. I don't think you should really be limping very much at one KNL on GG network because of the high rake structure. Different sites might play differently. Maybe it's all right. So I see a flop, queen, queen, deuce, rainbow. I hit my hand. A lot of you guys would probably just always call versus a half pot bet, but no board's very, very dry. It, it's not easy to have a pair and my hand needs protection. It can enjoy value. I decide to raise it up to $30 with the idea being my opponent is going to call me with a bunch of worse hands and also just fold a bunch of hands that have good equity versus my hand and take it down again. So second part of the session goes my way. Third hand of the session, four-way limp pot with queen five offsuit. I'm, I'm not going to raise this from a big blind. As this hand is happening on another table, I'm, I'm forced to fold queen 10 suited to a, a three bet and a cold call, which is actually an interesting situation because a lot of guys would think 
that someone called calling means you can continue wider, but but the truth is it it's act, it actually does not exactly work like that. Of course, it depends on stack sizes, relative position ranges, etc. I don't think Queen Ten Suited does particularly well in this kind of situation. There is less dead money or more dominated. It's tougher to continue with withdrawals and marginal pairs. So I decide to fold and limp multiway pot. We just have nothing in fold. Okay, next hand I have ace three offsuit heads up. Definitely gonna call get a do six a rainbow board. Kind of interesting board in that you know whenever boards are low, everyone misses a lot, and then a hand like ace three off, and this is something that I talk about in the check raising course that is up on the site. Check it out. It's a check raising candidate, right? Three to a straight. It has an over card. It, it actually beats some of the hands he's gonna bet call like the king highs. So, so it is a check raise candidate, and I uh, wanted to to get a bit aggressive with check raising in this session to start. So I decide to check raise. Sizing should be bigger than three x or go eighty five dollars, roughly three and a half x. This is to put my opponent's hands, such as two over cards, in a in a rough spot where if he has something like queen ten or jack ten, it's not easy for him to decide whether or not to continue. My opponent calls. I get seven of spades, which is actually an, an amazingly good turn card for my range, but not for my hand. This is probably one of, if not the worst hand I'm going to have in this situation. And, and usually I would barrel this turn extremely aggressively, but with a hand this bad, with only one over card, maybe it even has showdown value. I don't think it's a better entire range spot, so I decide to just check. Seven of diamonds on the river. Definitely a card I could have potentially hit if I check raised some draw with a seven. Then I'd have trips and be able to go for a big bet. So seven is actually kind of a nice card for me. Thinking about bluffing ace three is actually reasonable because I don't get here with, with that many hands that, that are unpaired because it turns so good for me. I actually decided to check it down and, and maybe win and showdown versus jack eight. Had I gone for some big bet on the river, I have no clue what my opponent would have done. I think it would be a tough spot for him with a hand like jack eight. Open king queen offsuit. UTG get three bet from the button. I decide to make a fold again. This is very, very positionally dependent, but uh, tight positions king queen is, is not all it's cracked up to be. So I open cut off with ace five off, which is a bit on the loose side. I get a queen jack three rainbow board versus Duan Ming, who has just 20 big blinds behind. While I often recommend checking when you get called called, here, due to the short stacks, I actually can put in stacks with a hand like a good top pair or an over pair, so I do get to bet with my range. So ace five is, is potentially a bet. I decided to check this time. Duan Ming checked back and I turned the five. So whereas I might want a bluff turn, certainly not when I pair. So I check, he half pots, and here I started having this kind of sneaky thought process where I was like, king 10, ace 10, 10, 9, 6, 7, ace 4, spade, like infinite draws. Doesn't look like he's trying to get stacks in, he didn't bet the flop, so I don't think he's particularly strong. If I call, there's going to be 120 with 170 behind, and maybe check raising works better, maybe he bet folds, pocket 7s or a jack sometimes, or whatever draw he has. So I actually decide to check raise all in with ace five. Definitely not GTO approved play, but, but I think it's all right given the circumstances. And Duan Ming, Duan Ming thinks and folds. Okay, next hand is another BVB hand versus Lucky Idiot, uh, where I have a seven again. Definitely mostly calling preflop, and I get queen six seven two tone. A middle pair top kicker, backdoor not flush draw, uh, really, really good board for a7. Of course, that doesn't mean I want to get stacks in, but uh, we're definitely not folding soon. And actually, Lucky Idiot goes with a, a fairly big c-bet. And this this is really important uh, whenever you're thinking what to do with a hand. Of course, I'm going to call a7, right? Like There's no question about what to do with my hand. But as we walk through the turn and the river play of the hand, this flop bet is extremely important to remember. Had he bet small, maybe he has deuces, maybe he has ace-jack, maybe he has king-six. When he bets big, there's a much bigger chance that the strategy he's playing is known as a polarized strategy. So 
a lot more bluffs and top pairs, right? So turn five of clubs, it's a really bad card for Lucky Idiot's range. We'll, we'll start with that because all the like king, queen, ace, queen, king's aces are, are super counterfeited uh, here and can't put in much more money. Then the question for me with a7 is, do I want to turn this into a bluff? There is not much point in going for protection given the range where I'm assigning my opponent. I don't think he often has something like pocket fours or king six or seven eight to call me with. I think those are, are unlikely. But he could easily have a queen or kings or aces, so I'm not interested in a small bet. Do I want to start bluffing? I, I thought this hand was, was too high up in my range, and I would rather start bluffing with king jack with king of clubs or, or something like that. You know, maybe four, four or five. So I decide to check back, get the nine of hearts, another good card for my range if you think about my opponent sitting there with various top pairs. Obviously he's not very happy, just imagine him sit sitting there with kings. Uh, do I want to bluff a7 again? Good question. It's fairly close, right? It's important to realize that I'm not necessarily winning just because I have a pair. Uh, the runout made it, so I get to a better reasonable amount of my pairs. Does this hand make it or not? Again, I, I wasn't sure. I decided to take the conservative route, lost to queen jack. I have no idea what my opponent would have done had I bet the river. So uh, I opened BVB versus CCLYL. 52 VPIP at this point, but not over too many hands and flop top two pair. So because the board is monotone, it's not a hand I'm gonna put piles of money in with. I bet quarter pot on a flop and get a quick call and decide to just barrel the turn with the idea being from my end. And again, you could go, oh, solver says to mix, blah, 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 blah. I go more with the principles of the solver and principles mean, you know, if your range is okay enough to bet, this hand is going to sometimes bet, sometimes check. And, and to understand that you want to be really focused on your opponent's range and be like, okay, he can have a bunch of worse one pair hands, maybe with a diamond, maybe he can have a draw with a diamond. All those hands are probably calling again. And then once I reach the river with king 8, given my blockers and everything, I might decide to check haul and hope my opponent has some busted straight draw, busted flush draw type of hand. So I decide to bet and my opponent puts in a small raise. I think it's, it's a really interesting spot to think ahead, right? Like, first of all, we'll start with you have to call turn with king 8 because you have 4 outs to a boat, worst case, right? Maybe I'm ahead of something, he's, he's going for value protection. Maybe he's bluffing, but worst case, I have four outs to a boat. That's like 9%. If I call, it's $52 to call. Pot's going to be 200. 9% of 200, even with no implied odds, is like $20. And I just need to call 52. And certainly there are going to be some implied odds. And sometimes I have the best chance. So there's no falling on the turn. But you have to already start using this time to think about your opponent's range. How likely is he to be bluffing? What are the bluffs going to be? If it's value heavy, what are you going to do on the river with king eight? Because once you get to the river, and of course you check, uh, here we get a brick and your opponent bets, king eight is no longer beating any value hands. And at this point, it's a, it's a zero EV bluff catcher. Why zero EV? Presumably my opponent's not going to bluff with a king or an eight. So I unblock the bluffing range. I also unblock the value range. So it's just thought these are the type of hands that are zero EV. King Jack with a Jack of Spades would be minus EV. King Jack with a Diamond or King Eight tend to be roughly zero EV in these kind of spots. Here, Solver would probably tell me to mix with King Eight. Maybe call thirty percent. Maybe call ninety percent. It doesn't really matter to me. Even if it's call a hundred percent and win a quarter of a big blind, I, I don't really care. I'm more trying to think about the spot and the psychology of the spot. And there is nothing about how the hand would play was played that should trigger my opponent to decide to run a big bluff, right? I bet small on the flop. Usually if people want to bluff, they bluff there. Once I barrel a brick turn, generally people keep calling draws, they fold loose floats, and there are no bluff raises for most people. So I think this is actually a fairly trivial fold against a non-top reg, certainly against a non-non, where the idea would be there's nothing about the spot that induces him to bluff. Had I bet quarter pot, quarter pot, that's different. Had the runout been something, you know, like 
straight comes in, flush comes in, not this particular board, middle card pairs, like there, there are runouts that induce people to bluff it. This isn't one of them, so I think this is a very straightforward fold, but mental state that I'm in, I could not piece this together. It was like my gut was telling me to fold, but my brain couldn't, couldn't pull the trigger. So I decide to call and get shown the bad news, flush from my opponent, and I think this is one of those spots where non-tilted Uri would, would fold, would, would realize. And, and this is really putting lots of puzzle pieces together and being able to shrug off the fact that I know my hand is fine to call and, and go deeper than that. And I, I think that's uh, something I do not do as well lately, which is part of the reason. I'm going to be doing more analysis like this. Let's actually wrap up the video here. Let me know if you guys like it or not. I'm happy to do a bunch more like this. Uh, they help me personally, just kind of thinking through the hands. Even though these are not the games I play, I'm just practicing the poker thought process, like the the real practical poker thought process. Because at this point, like what's GTO, I, I know in my sleep. But there is so much play in all the mixed decisions such as whether to stab 8-9 in, in the first hand or whether to raise deuce 9 in another limped pot or what to do with king 8 here on the river. And I think this is just a blunder by me. Let me know if you guys like the format, if you want just bigger hands, you want all the hands, something else. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed it, like and subscribe to the channel, engage in the comments, check out our website, and I'll see you guys next time.